All right. Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining joining us for tonight's webinar. I am Darla Pompilio of Your Tasks, Our Time, and we provide downsizing, right sizing, senior move management, and professional organizing services. Our goal for tonight's presentation is to clear up the confusion about the various levels of care available to seniors. Our organization is a Senior Services Network of Southeastern PA. We started Senior Services Network because most people are not sure where to begin when navigating resources and often don't know what resources are needed until something actually happens. So we are a group of professionals focused on providing services to seniors. Our goal is to be one place for seniors, caregivers, and families can have access to service providers in the Southeastern PA area. So with that tonight, I would like to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker is Kim Sager. She is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Bridges of Warwick. Kim has been with Bridges um, at Warwick since 2015 and has worked with seniors for over 30 years in New Jersey, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania. As the first, first employee of this new community in Bucks County, Kim was able to forge relationships with the community at large, including schools, churches, and civic organizations. A graduate of the University of Delaware with degrees in history and political science, working with older folks has, uh, was her opportunity to share in their living history. As a national certified dementia practitioner, she has the ability not only to relate and care for memory care residents, but can also help their original caregivers, their families, through the delicate process of placement in the Bridges community. Our second speaker will be Betsy Zambodi. Betsy has always been a natural caregiver. So when her stepfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2006, she left the traditional workforce and became a full-time caregiver uh, to stay home and help her mother care for him. She also took care of a friend's mom diagnosed with dementia. Betsy did this work for three years and then re-entered the workforce through the healthcare field to help families navigate this challenging time for their loved ones. Betsy is a national certified dementia practitioner and her understanding of the needs of families during this emotional and intense time fuels her passion to help find real solutions for families and share her collective experience to shed some light on the journey they're taking with their loved ones. She's been working in healthcare since 2009 and joined Artist Senior Living in 2016. Working at Artist has allowed her to work with knowledgeable, dedicated team, with a knowledgeable, dedicated team and showcase the best lifestyle and care available for an individual with dementia. So before our speakers begin, I want to invite those who have questions for the panelists to please add those questions into the chat. Um, after both speakers have completed their presentations, then we will go to your questions immediately after they're, after they're finished. So with that, Kim, I'm gonna have you take it away. All right, thanks, Darla. Thanks very much. 30 years, wow, it sounds like I've been doing this since I was in kindergarten, but it's not. <laughs> So thank you all who um, are joining us tonight. It's a, a really important topic for people to understand what's going on, um, you know, with each family and what is available to them. We, uh, we've been doing this, Betsy and I, for years and years, and it can still seem confusing the way we title things and the names for things. So Darla had put up um, a screen with different levels of care and what different things are called. So I just wanted to go through those very quickly, and then I'll explain what it is that we do in a personal care or assisted living community. So personal care and assisted living, if you live anywhere but Pennsylvania in the United States of America, it's called assisted living. Pennsylvania likes to be special, so we call it personal care. There are two licenses in the state of Pennsylvania, one for personal care, one for assisted living. They basically do about the same thing. 
but um, one is set up with a little bit more restrictions without any more benefits to having it. It might change. Pennsylvania is also one of the only states in our um, area that does not accept Medicaid in personal care. If that were to ever change, I think every community would move towards assisted living, but for right now, it's really not a benefit in the state of Pennsylvania. So personal care and assisted living, that's where someone that needs assistance, it's exactly like it says, assistance with living. So if you need help with your meals, with your medications, with um, getting dressed, getting showered, um, your activities of daily living, all the things that we do to be healthy um, each day, our meals, things like that, that all falls under the umbrella of assisted living personal care in Pennsylvania. Memory care is also under the personal care or assisted living umbrella, but Betsy's going to explain that in greater detail um, in a bit. So more on our slide is about palliative care. I'm sorry that I'm the one that has to say that because I mess that up every time. That falls under hospice care. It's a not as um, intense part of care as hospice care can be. We are going to have um, a whole seminar in April about hospice care. It is um, often misunderstood. Lots of folks think hospice is for the last three months of my life. That's the only time or three weeks of my life. Folks that need that additional support and care can benefit from hospice care. It's almost sad when a family signs up for hospice care too late. It's so much better if they have that support and that care. It's covered by your Medicare, and it's really a wonderful additional benefit. Whether you're in the hospital, you are in a nursing home, you're in a personal care home, or you're in your own home, hospice can take care take place in any of those um, situations. Skilled nursing is what we might all think of from when we were children. It was that place where everyone was in a wheelchair and people were in rooms with curtains dividing the rooms and things like that. Yes, that still is out there, but um, there are nursing homes that are um, a whole lot more upbeat, if you will. Um, I think the shift has come that what 30 years ago, they were the folks who needed skilled nursing. They're now living in assisted living and personal care homes because we can handle such a higher level of care um, in this type of situation. Your skilled nursing home is really for someone who is completely bed bound, um, they're on IVs, they're on feeding tubes, things like that. They're the folks that really need that intense nursing care, and that's what you find in a skilled nursing facility. Um, sometimes, I'm going to add this one in there, if someone has a hospital stay, they might qualify for rehab, and that is done at a skilled nursing facility. It's done short term to help folks get stronger so that they can return to home or re you know, possibly return to a personal care community or make a move to a personal care community. Sometimes folks will be living at home, have a fall, they go to the hospital, they go to the um, rehab at a skilled nursing, and then the family, the doctors, the social workers really decide that it's just not safe for mom or dad to be at home alone anymore, and they make that transition. So sometimes folks are looking at skilled nursing just for that short-term rehab. Sometimes it is a long-term placement. So I'll speak more in depth about uh, a personal care community because that's what we do here at the Bridges at Warwick. So personal care is for that person who needs assistance with managing their medications, their meals, um, any of their personal care that they might need assistance with, whether it's transfers, at, in and out of bed, on and off of the toilet, to their meals. That's what falls under personal care. It is also a place where folks have engagement and enjoyment people are having meals together, quite often someone will say, well, you know, my mom's really lost weight. She's, she's not eating. My, my dad passed away and she's depressed and she's not eating. 
you come into a community setting like this, you have your meals prepared for you in a dining room area, um, and you have friends and people to eat with and to have company and to be comfortable with. So um, it's really more about people thriving rather than just surviving. Sometimes people in their homes, they say, no, I'm doing fine. I'm getting by. I'm okay. I'm getting by. But do we really want our um, older folks that we love so much to just be getting by and we're just making it? We're just, we're surviving. Community life can sometimes be a place where people are getting that care that they need while they're also thriving and enjoying their life. Um, different activities that are tailored around what people enjoy. No one has to just decide I've moved into a personal care community and I'm going to pay bingo the rest of my life or go to Bible study the rest of my life. It could be music. It could, um, there's always religious opportunities. There's games, there's crafts, there's different things that folks might enjoy. I will say for our residents, a whole group of my ladies learned what binge watching was during the pandemic. <laughs> it was quite fun. They binge their way through the crown and now they're going through Miss Maisel or something like that. So um, they're definitely having fun and enjoying their life. And, and that's what we want for our folks as they age um, in this um, wonderful area. So I think that's about it for personal care. And Betsy, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can talk more about what memory care does for folks. Oh, thanks, Kim. Uh, well said. Thank really you. well said. Um, so with memory care. So Memory care, it's a lot like personal care with extra added support. So as supportive as personal care is, memory care just adds more support onto that for folks struggling cognitively. So the needs of someone with memory impairment is that's going to increase as their dementia progresses. So dementia doesn't stop, it keeps progressing and therefore the needs are, are increasing. So memory care does everything that personal care does, medication management, meals together, programming. It does all that, plus addresses the whole person, their physical needs as they're changing, their emotional needs as they're changing, their social needs as they're changing, and their spiritual well-being at, at, at every stage of the disease process. So an individual's care kind of revolves around these four needs. So just to illustrate, you know, a person living with memory impairment, dementia, you know, I'll, I'll interchange those terms, memory impairment, cognitive decline, dementia. Um, so a person living with that, they may need a lot of redirection throughout the day, a lot of assurance. Um, they may have anxiety throughout the day. I have a lady living with us right now that she gets a lot of anxiety throughout the day and she needs someone to uh, you know, uh, just talk her through it. You might have another resident that says that they want to go home or they want to go on a trip. Well, we tend to, we meet them where they're at. It's usually a feeling that they're uh, having more so than that they really want to go home. Their home might be actually their childhood home. And so we want to, and in memory care, we kind of try to tap into those feelings and, and soothe, help to soothe our residents. So a care partner may show them pictures of their family or initiate a task that they've enjoyed in the past. Some folks uh, struggle with PS or PTSD from maybe their war years. So, you know, there's always ways of bringing, pulling people back to a time where they may find more comfort or they may have so enjoyed um, their pets, so maybe showing them pictures of their pets or their family, and that could bring them back into a time that's more comforting because, you know, wherever they were in their mind at that one time of anxiety, you're, you're, getting, you're trying to get them into another space. So memory care plans intentional programming as well, based on information that we've gathered about our residents from what they've enjoyed in the past. And there's always new things that they might start to enjoy. Someone that never painted might decide to start painting and they're good at it and they enjoy it. And we set all of our residents up 
for success. So a task can be broken down or just simplified. Um, a, a watercolor, uh, you know, painting can be, um, we, we purchase silhouettes and then have our residents paint with watercolors over top of silhouettes and they're beautiful and, and our residents feel good about it. So when an individual has a diagnosis of dementia, if they're still living at home, if it's becoming unsafe, it's a good idea to consider memory care. Also, if someone's living in a traditional personal care with the diagnosis of dementia, they, they may feel more supported in memory care. So, and a move into a memory care community definitely requires a diagnosis of dementia. So talking about how memory care is similar to personal care and assisted living, but different, I've identified three different ways. I think it's, uh, it's different. The building layout and the security of the building. So memory care has a secured perimeter. So it has enhanced security. So through both indoor and outdoor spaces, there's freedom to explore throughout the indoors and the outdoors without having access to parking lots and busy streets. So that prevents someone from wandering away from the building and keeping them safe all day long, 24 seven. So the floor plan of a good memory care would also be uncomplicated and would make use good use of decor and color as sources of wayfinding. So at my community, we've got different neighborhoods and they each have a different design theme. We have one neighborhood that's a Victorian neighborhood. We have another that's more of a beach house, which everyone wants to live in the beach house. <laughs> and um, so it helps with wayfinding. So uh, residents tend to, um, you know, recognize those different uh, colors and, and objects. So number two would be approach and socialization. So memory care offers a supportive network with other residents and staff that doesn't require time to develop either. It starts on day one. So staff embraces the residents immediately and new residents are engaged and part of the group as soon as they move in. And programs are thoughtfully planned uh, to be successful for those struggling with memory impairment, like I mentioned before. And they're also planned intentionally to stimulate senses and movement. We start out every day with exercise. We keep hydrating throughout the day. It's very important um, to keep hydrating and um, so these are like certain things that we, you know, we definitely plan very, very uh, routine throughout our day. And care is really responsive and customized for everyone's specific needs throughout their disease process. I have a gentleman moving in and he likes to take walks every day. So that's gonna be really important in his care plan for that to keep continuing. And we'll remind him and make sure that he gets bundled up if it's too cold out. Um, if it's too hot out, you know, we'll make sure he's dressed appropriately and we'll keep an eye to him. And, but it's very important for him to have that type of activity every day. So that's part of the, the important things for our residents. We, we really try to put those in place. So memory care communities have even have a specialized support group just for the caregivers and families that are caring for their loved ones with dementia. So that's important too, because it, it is different uh, when someone has cognitive change. It is, it is a different, uh, families can be very emotional about it. It's something that you know, we can't control and um, they need to be heard and feel supported. So I think we do a good job at that. Then, then number three would be training of staff. So staff are trained specifically on all dementias and how to approach care for someone at every stage. Uh, working in memory care takes a lot of patience, empathy, and the willingness to be a detective to figure out how to reach an individual and offer them great life at any point of the disease process that they're in. So we have to hire very specifically for the, the right type of care partner. And we, at, at my company, we use the term care partner because, and I think that's kind of uh, catching on for most companies as well, most communities because we are really partnering with our residents and partnering with our families for the care 
no matter what level of care you're at um, for the care of their loved ones. And um, so it's really, uh, it's very important to take care of your staff and take and so that they can take very good care of your loved ones and you know our residents. So I think that kind of sums everything up and uh, back to you, Darla. All right, ladies, thank you. It's great information. We do have some questions um, that people have put in the chat. Um, so I'm just gonna toss them out and then you guys can decide who's gonna answer. Sure. Um, so how, how do you know which community is right for you? Oh, can I take this one, Betsy? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I am on the tail end of three kids going through college. And I take, uh, all of my children went to different colleges. Heaven forbid they make life easy. One of them went to multiple. And they had to find what felt right to them. And I think in the United States, there has to be like 3,000 colleges. I think there's 35 in Philadelphia alone. So there's thousands of colleges out there, but for each kid, there's one that feels right. And they go and they think, yep, this is me. This is where I'm gonna be comfortable. This is where I'm gonna make my friends. This is where I'm gonna have this great experience. And I really think it's the same for a senior living community. You're gonna go and you're gonna experience different communities. And for some, you're gonna say, no, these aren't my people. This isn't where I see my mom or this isn't what I think would be right for my dad. But then another, you're gonna be like, yeah, this is right. I can see my dad participating in this or I can see my mom chatting with these ladies. So I think it's a lot of a feeling. Uh -huh. I think it's really important that you're comfortable with the people that you meet. Um, I make sure that when folks come to my community, they meet everybody we go by because I'm not the only person that's here that's going to help someone. So you need to, to meet the maintenance director and the nursing director and hopefully the executive director and have a good feel for who's going to take care of your loved ones. But I really think it comes down to looking and learning and then really getting that feeling for which one do I think is going to just suit my family best? What do you think? Betsy? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You have to be able to, if well, if it's, if you're choosing for your loved one, you have to be able to see them there, mm -hmm. you know, be able to, you know, yeah, I can see my mom uh, mm -hmm. here and I could, or I could see my dad. Um, yeah. And if you're choosing for yourself, uh, it, it, it has to be the right, you have to feel it. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. And meeting everybody. And if the staff is happy, I, I always think that's a good, a good uh, marker. If you encounter happy staff, that means yeah. it's, there's a happy, there, you know, that's really important because yeah. that, that creates an energy too. Yeah. So I know- And other I'm, residents. You want to see and, how the other residents are and- I, yes. I'm always coming around a corner and I'll be like, oh boy, what's he going to say? But <laughs> you know, the residents, they, they say the truth and why they're happy and what, you know, I've been on, I've been on visits with people and I'm showing families around and someone will say, Kim, the soup this morning was lousy or, you know, this was bad. And I'm like, geez, but we do the best we can. We say it all the time. We're people taking care of people. And if that's our biggest fault, that one day the salt, the uh, soup was salty or the oatmeal was lumpy, it's all right. It happens at my house too. Yeah. So um, we love to, you know, see how other families interact with the residents and mm -hmm. they can kind of look and see how people are. Yeah, no, great points. Great yeah. points. All right, ladies, thank you. Um, we actually have several questions. So the next one is Is there any point? as a person's dementia progresses, when you feel it may not be appropriate for them to remain in memory care? Um, normally, when someone moves into memory care, that's a good question. When someone moves into memory care, um, they can stay in memory care throughout the, uh, the, through the rest of their life. 
Now, right. certain instances um, where they may have had a stroke and maybe they are paralyzed on one side, that would be a transition to a skilled nursing home. Right. But norm, but uh, or say, um, well, memory care is is uh, you know it is all private pay as well. So if they've if they've exceeded if they're running out of funds, then that would that would encourage a transition uh, to a nursing home. But for the most part, if someone has uh, the financial picture and they are. Um, just declining in their uh, with their dementia, they can usually go on to a hospice within the memory care and continue uh, uh, live out their life. Um, you know, with the memory care that they're living in. Uh, even we can, if even if they, if um, most most communities can be creative, and even if you know someone's loved one needs another. Uh, aid to come in. You know, we've worked with families and have done that. Um, you know, if someone is more of a two person transfer, it takes two people to transfer them from the uh, commode to the bed to the uh, ch uh, chair or the chair to the to the bed. But like I said, normally, my answer would be normally it's someone lives their life out with us. But there are certain instances um, where they might transition to skilled nursing, one being a stroke or, uh, you know, running out of funds, that would be another. But if I could just add on here, sure. sure. Um, artists is an amazing memory care community and they focus specifically on memory care. The bridges, we have a larger personal care and a smaller memory care for our residents, mostly for our residents who are, um, have lived with us and now need that, you know, higher and extra support level of care yeah and sometimes folks move in straight to our memory care but for the most part it's you know for our residents we we um we have the same philosophy as what betsy explained for um, her community but not all communities are like that so it's a really important question to yeah it is an important question before right before you move into a community because i can say for my community and i i'm i'm 99 sure betsy's is the same if you move into my community and you're in memory care and you are um, able to feed yourself you know fork to to mouth with some prompting and cueing and things like that in memory care that's fine and we'll continue to do that and if you decline which is part of what dementia is is that right. slow decline we will our caregivers will then if we need to fully assist with feeding uh -huh. you you will right there are other communities that will say nope too much for us it's time for you to move to a nursing home so Sometimes it's really important, not sometimes, it's always really important to ask those what if long term questions. Right. Because mom might be great and doing all those things, but just needs some memory support right now. But it's a progressive disease, and you want to make sure that mom's going to stay where she is, unless there's something catastrophic, like catastrophic, a, you know, right. paralyzing stroke or something like right. that. Right, right. Right, and thank you, Kim. That that's a great point. And and you know it, the the stroke I mentioned was the paralyzing stroke on the mm -hmm. on on one side, um, but you know uh, so just just to clarify that. But right, yeah, it's we that that's a I didn't realize that some other communities don't do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So next question is um, how do most people pay for care? Do you want to take that or shucks? I was going to do that. That's what you do. <laughs> so I mentioned it really quickly um, when I said that Pennsylvania is one of the very few states that does not accept Medicaid in a personal care community. And again, personal care is the license that you carry. So a memory care community still carries a personal care license. Right. Um, Unfortunately, Medicaid will pay for a nursing home, but they will not pay for a personal care or memory care community. It doesn't make any sense at all because we're less expensive. But if someone does not have the finances mm -hmm. to pay privately 
for a personal care or memory care community. And then they do need to be in a skilled nursing facility. Mm -hmm. So for us, our residents pay privately based on their um, social security, on their pensions. Um, some folks have a long-term care policy that they're able to use um, that they've owned for years and now they're um, activating that for their care. Um, folks use you know, the sale of a home or something like that. So it is what I say to, to folks quite often, because it is expensive. I'm not gonna pretend that it's not, it is expensive. Right. And when folks kind of get that sticker shock, I had the most lovely man once who looked, his wife needed memory care and he looked at his three sons and he said, all right, guys, here goes your inheritance. And they were like, whatever mom needs. But what I said to him was, you know how you saved for all those years for when you needed it? Well, this is it. That's what you saved for. So it is all private in um, the state of Pennsylvania. And um, folks kind of draw down from those different different funds and assets. And, and there is a seminar that I should give a plug right. to. Um, that one is in March that will help folks understand how to protect assets for, um, for, you know, if you have a husband and wife situation and how you in the long term pay for this type of care. So um, I'm sure Darla will give you the exact date, but that's an important one to attend also. That's March, yeah, March 16th. Okay. Yes. So uh, in addition to that question, um, somebody chimed in and said, don't forget that VA benefits can help pay for something. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you and you have to qualify for those Correct. benefits as well. So you have to, I think it's, don't you have to have had active duty during wartime? Active duty during, even if it's one day during wartime and you never had to see the um, action or even be in the country of action. I have a gentleman that just qualified. Um, he was in during Korea. He never went to Korea. He was in a support role in the United States, but um, financially he did and time of service, he did qualify for VA benefits. Yeah, it's a, and it's a good deal of money. Yep, it's a monthly. Yeah, it, is, it is a good deal of money. Yeah, right? it's very helpful. And, and, and not only the person that was in the service, but their spouse can benefit as yep. well. Yep. Okay, thank you, ladies. Um, so the next question is, what is the average age of those entering the community? Oh, well that, and that depends. Um, the average age, I, I would say anywhere from, what do you think, Kim? Uh, it's a little younger for memory care. For memory care, it's a little younger. It could be it yeah. could be fifty five to that's to really to a hundred. It yeah, could be oh, oh average age. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, I'm like average I've had one fifty five. That's I'm fifty five. That scares me. <laughs> average age is about eighty five for memory yeah, care. Um, yeah, and for personal care, what do you think? Maybe. Yeah, it's about the same around eighty five. Yeah. Um, yeah, my average, average age. My average age right now is 88. So, I mean, that means I've got somebody that's 75 and I've got somebody that's 95, 98. So, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Me memory care, you know, we've got the earlier onset. So, right. There's only a one or the uh, one or two of those that happen, you know, at all. And, uh, but it could go up to say, you know, a hundred, you know, that we, mm -hmm. you know, someone could move in, uh, your, or turn a hundred when they're living with us. So, yeah. Yeah. and it's a two to three year stay uh, on average in memory care. Okay. So do you have to be a certain age to move into a community? Um, some communities, uh, I, mm -hmm. I don't have an, av uh, a, an age of, you know, a, a, a certain age in memory care. How about you, Kim? So I don't have an age for memory care. No, it's just having that diagnosis of dementia. Mm -hmm. um, for personal care, again, it's private pay. So we need to make sure that folks realize um, that it is a long-term situation. I did have a woman once that was much younger, um, uh, muscular uh, MS, I think she had, and she really needed the assistance from us. But um, 
I, typically we're 72 and above is for the personal care part of the community. Yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. So uh, next question is, what are the costs and fees? So the costs and fees for, and I can only speak right now for my community, for artists, we have a $3,200 one-time community fee. And then upon assessment, we'll determine um, the care that is needed for us to put in place and what your loved one can still do for themselves. And you know, based on that, it's either, we have two tiers of pricing. It's either $6,800 a month or $7,800 a month. So along with that, and that's a one-time community fee. And then that's just a monthly charge uh, that you pay as a, it's a fee for service. So it's month to month that you'd be paying that. Yeah, and it's pretty consistent in this area. Um, personal care is a little different. So um, my memory care is all inclusive. There's one flat fee. Um, personal care, you pick the size of apartment that you want. I have five different sizes of apartments. And then it's um, an additional fee for your care that you need. So I will also, just like I said, you know, ask the questions. We make it confusing. And oh, I don't mean Betsy and I, I mean the people that we all work for. They make it yeah. confusing because they package things differently and they add this, right. they add that. So someone will call me and be like, whoa, you're a thousand dollars more above the, you know, the place down the street. And there was a new community that was so inexpensive, but I would say, well, go have your assessment. And then they would say, oh my gosh, their assessment. Now I'm at the same price. So it's, I don't mean to simplify things, but I kind of boiled it down to, we all have to pay the Pico bill. We all have to keep the lights on. Right. We all have to pay the Cisco bill. We need the food to come in and we all need to pay our care partners and our team and all the folks who do the work here. And we all get there a little differently sometimes, but we all have to get there. So it is um, it is probably one of the trickiest parts of figuring out long term care. What can a community do for me and how do I really weed through what these costs mean? Right. OK, ladies, I have one more question for you. Um, so how do seniors who no longer drive get out to the stores or to the community? So mine, um, we do bus trips. We um, have, well, you know, we used to have bus trips all the time. And then we had this little thing COVID, called COVID. Right. And the whole world <laughs> shut down. Changed a lot of things. Um, we actually, this community took um, possession of a brand new bus. We lease them every two years. We took possession of a brand new bus in February of 20. And we just turned it back in with like 2000 miles on it because it's a 14 passenger bus. We also have a van. So we, we couldn't put, it was craziness. Um, but so for us, we'll do trips. Um, we do transportation for all, um, for, you know, families want to use our transportation for doctor's appointments, um, but just different things. If folks want to get out and do trips and things like that, it's, it's on the bus for a, a shopping trip. Again, you know, there's a couple good benefits of COVID. Everybody got really good at grocery delivery and Instacart <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Um, now I will say for our memory care residents, they would only go on a um, an organized trip with the appropriate amount of caregivers to make sure that folks are safe and they're really right. not going shopping and buying anything. Um, but if we're going out for ice cream or something like that, they're just that needs to be much more structured and organized to make right. sure that you have the appropriate care for them. Right, right. Yeah, our residents, they're not driving anymore. So they're going out with their families. Uh, we don't have a bus, an artist bus at this point point um we may down in the future uh, you know in the future but um and then once covid is over we will get uh we'll do bus trips you know we'll get the uh, bucks county trans transport bus to take us to you know maybe to uh you know uh shady brook for the <laughs> light do. show Right. Shady Brook is the best. We Shady went, <laughs> I think we went every three days during the holiday season. There was that bus was going to Shady Brook. Every three That's days. fun. That's great. fun. It's a great light show. Yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, so we'll do, you know, trips to Bowman's Hill or, you know, uh, take drives out for ice cream, those sorts of things. And like Kim was saying, memory care would just be a little bit more structured and, and care partners would have to be involved. Yeah. All right, ladies. Well, thank you so much. It was, uh, you know, thank you, Kim and Betsy, for the informative and educational presentation. Um, this is an area that is so confusing, as you both have acknowledged for people. Um, this webinar was really enlightening. I had, you know, uh, no idea of, I guess, the, well, first of all, the number of types of dementia there are out there, but, you know, just, it's really informative. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. So um, let me see if I can go. So before we close, I would like to highlight our upcoming presentations. Um, our next webinar, uh, as Betsy said, is in March and um, it's about protecting assets with Rich Newman of the Law Office of Rich Newman, Richard L. Newman, and Dave Emery of Planning Capital Management. And then our, the presentations following um, the Protecting Asset presentation is end of life planning, trust planning, and what to do after a loved one passes away. So we have our presentations uh, once a month. Um, I believe it's, what are we, the third Wednesday? Second or third Wednesday? Third. Uh, the third, thank you. The third Wednesday of each month. And um, we do have a very short three question survey that we would very much appreciate those who have attended. Um, we really appreciate if you could complete that. The survey will help us plan for future topics and that will keep us on track for creating con the content that you want and you need. And uh, finally, we are happy to answer any questions about what we do and we, we invite you to check out our website. Um, if you have any questions about this evening's presentation, please feel free to reach out directly to our speakers. And before we sign off, we have one more question. Oh, no. No question, but somebody said we did a really good, you, you not me, you ladies did a great job. Thanks, Rich. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Rich. So until next time, we look forward to hearing from you and hope that um, you, your family, and your loved ones will join us each month for our webinars. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Good night. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Darla. Good night. Good night. Bye, ladies.